Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email them to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. Before we do get started, I do want to let you know this program is brought to you by the financial support of our listeners. And uh, we have uh, a couple of people to thank. First, August became our latest Patreon supporter. Thanks so much, August. You can uh, support the great detectives of old time radio with an automatic uh, monthly donation through patreon.greatdetectives.net. And Linda also, uh, thank you so much, she went ahead and she sent a uh, donation to our P.O. Box. Uh, P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. And you can also support the show at support.greatdetectives.net. Over at greatdetectives.net this weekend, my review of the Audible.com release, Poirot's Finest Cases. And this uh, overall lives up to its name. You can read my full review there. Uh, you can also have reviews delivered automatically to your inbox uh, and try that service out free for two weeks if you're Kindle at the Kindle. Just search for Great Detectives of Old Time Radio in the Kindle store. Well, now it's time for today's episode of Dragnet. The original air date, June the 8th of 1950, and the title is The Big Smart Guy. The story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide detail. A woman has been shot to death. The apparent motive, robbery. The killer's still at large. Your job, find him. the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Friday, March 16th. It was damp in Los Angeles. We are working the night watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 11.45 p.m. when we got to where we'd parked our car. Second in Maine. Couple of drops on the windshield. Yeah, I hope it holds off. I was thinking of going out to see the Cubs and Pirates play an exhibition game tomorrow. Guess maybe now I won't. You might be lucky. What's the weatherman say? I don't know. Get the radio off. It's a slow night. Yeah, uh Might not be tomorrow night. What? March 17th, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Sixty-two A, call your station. All units in vicinity of 102 South Virgil, 211 and shooting, code 3. It's a hot one. All units in vicinity of 102 South Virgil, 211 and shooting, code 3. Unit 13, take the call. Happy St. Patrick's Day. 11.58 p.m., we arrived at 102 South Virgil, the Bartlett Hotel, a four-story building. Sergeant Scheimer met us in the lobby and informed us that the shooting took place at 11.40 p.m. in room 432, occupied by Mr. and Mrs. Theodore V. Benham. Mrs. Benham was the victim. We went up to the fourth floor where Officer McCready was stationed outside the room. Any witnesses? Only Benham says it was a thief. Did you talk to any of the people on this floor? None of them saw anything. They were all in their rooms. Any other way out of here? Uh... Stairway in the rear leads to the roof. I took a look. Nothing up there. Mm-hmm. Where's Benham? Across the hall, lying down. Cox is with him. Okay. Let's look at the body. We went into the room, a dreary place with a single light hanging from the center of the ceiling. The carpet was faded and worn in spots. 
On the north side were a closet and a bathroom. Against the east wall was a dresser. Across the room was a double bed, and at the foot of the bed, a window looking out over the roofs of adjoining buildings and the marquee of a movie house down the street. A steamer trunk was in the corner, and a straight-back chair was next to the door. The mirror of the dresser was smashed, and on the dresser, a Gideon Bible. On the bed was the body of a woman sprawled face down. There were several splotches of blood on her coat. From the chair was a 3220 revolver, which McCready said belonged to Benham, the husband of the murdered woman. We asked McCready to put in a call to the crime lab, and we went across the hall to question Benham. This is an awful shock. I'm not feeling well. I'm under doctor's care. Hemophilia. It's an awful shock. Sit down, please. Yes. I... I don't know what it'll do to me. I should be in the sanitarium right now. We'll see you're taken care of. Lincoln Sanitarium in Eagle Rock. Could you tell us what happened tonight? Why, yes. We, my wife and I went out to the Sycamore Cafe over in Alvarado. What time was that? Oh, about 9.30. We had a couple of drinks and something to eat. And listened to a piano player, then came home. I unlocked the door and Elizabeth went in first, went over to the dresser. I just walked over to her when a man stepped out of the closet in the back of us. He had a gun. Mm-hmm. Can you describe him? I don't know, I don't know. Did you see his face? No. He had a blue bandana over his face and he had a cap on, a blue and white check. Did you notice his clothes? No, no, I didn't. Anything else? Well, he seemed very nervous and he wasn't holding the gun still. When my wife was opening a purse and I said, well, I haven't got very much, but I'll give you what we have. And he fired and hit Elizabeth. I pulled my gun from my overcoat and started shooting. Are you in the habit of carrying a gun? no. No, no, I'd noticed suspicious-looking men follow me lately, so I bought one. Is uh, this the gun here? Yes. Then what happened? Well, I fired all the bullets. I don't know how I missed the room. Small. He kept moving around all the time. Mm Mm-hmm. But uh, I guess I did miss. Then he ran out of the room. But how old would you say this man was? Officer, I haven't the faintest idea. Uh, See you a minute, Sergeant. Sure. We'll be back, Mr. Benham. This has been an awful shock to me. I wonder how his wife felt. McCready told us that Sergeant Shimer had found a woman in the Nevada hotel next door who might know something. We went next door and questioned Mrs. Caroline Cromwell, a resident of the hotel. She occupied room 415 on the top floor. She told us that about 20 seconds after she heard the shots, she looked out the door of her room and saw a man come down the back stairs, which leads to the roof of the hotel, and enter room 402. She'd seen the man several times and was positive of her identification. Sergeant Shimer said the man was registered as Jack Morrison. We went to room 402. Try it again. Who's that? Police officer. What do you want? I'd like to ask a couple of questions. I was going to bed. We'd like to talk to you. Won't take very long. All right. What do you want to know? How long have you been in your room? About ten minutes. What? Where were you? To the movie. Which one? Right down the street. Why are you asking me all these questions? You been drinking? A little. Not much. Mind if we look around a little? I was out all the time. I didn't know nothing about a shooting. Then you won't mind if we look around. You won't find nothing here. These all the clothes you've got? Yeah. This your coat? Yeah. Yo. Mm -hmm. You're wearing this tonight, were you? No. It's the only coat in the closet. What'd you do with the coat you were wearing? Guess I was wearing that one. Did you spill it? What? A bottle of whiskey. It broke. How? How do I know? You got a hole here in the sleeve. What'd you do with a broken bottle? Threw it away. Where? I don't know. On the street. Joe, I found something. A shirt stuck down between the wall and the bathtub. Looks like blood on it. Is this yours? Where's the shirt you wore tonight? Take off your pajama top. Why? Take it off. All right. But I didn't have nothing to do with that shooting next door. What happened to your arm? Guy shot at me. Who? I don't know. I bought a bottle and had a couple of drinks and went to the movie for a little while. Would you mind moving away from the bed, please? No, no. Thank you. 
I came out of the movie because I was getting dizzy. I went up on the roof here to get some air. While I was standing there, a guy ran across the roof and shot at me. What would the man look like? I don't know. He came from the roof of the hotel next door and ran into this place. How big was he? It was dark. I couldn't see. What did you do? Well, after I was sure he was gone, I came down. I was going to have my arm fixed in the morning. Better get your clothes on. Why? Well, you got a pretty bad arm. You better have it fixed up. We'll take you to George Street Receiving Hospital. It's all right. I don't have to go there. Find anything, Ben? No. You got a clean shirt? No. Well, you better wear your pajama top, then. Oh, here's something. What did you say your name is? Jack Morris. Here's a card I found in the closet. It says, Tommy Kane, report for work Joe's Cafe, 8 o'clock, March 1st. Who's Tommy Kane? That's me. Where are you from? Elgin, Illinois. How old are you? I'm 22. Why'd you leave Elgin? No work. I've been bumming around. You ever been arrested? I was picked up on a vague charge a month ago. Here? Yeah. I don't know why you guys are bothering with me. When somebody gets shot, we bother. 1.30 a.m., we took King to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, where they found that a muscle in his upper right arm had been severed and the right side of his chest was bruised. Before taking him to Ward 1300 General Hospital for further treatment, we took him back to the roof of the Nevada Hotel. It's still trying to rain. Yeah. Well, where were you standing when you got shot at, King? Right over there. I was leaning against the bricks. Where'd the man come from? Out of that door in the other roof. Roof of the Bartlett Hotel? Yeah. Was he running when he shot at you? Yeah, yeah, he was. Where'd he run? Right across here where we are. And then he went through this door here into the Nevada Hotel. Did you notice anything unusual about him? Well, his face was covered with a handkerchief and he wore a checkered cap. Thought you said before it was too dark. Well, I could see that. I mean, you know, I could see that. I couldn't see his face. And you were standing over there by the parapet? Yeah. Well, about, uh, about, about here? Yeah, that's it. Mm-hmm. All right, let's get over the roof of the bar. It's a little high. Can I help you over? No. Come on, Ben. You ever been in this hotel before, Kane? No. Everything all right, McCready? Yeah. Crime lab's here. Check in the murder room. Ben, I'm awake. I think so. Mr. Benham? Yes? Mind if we come in? Of course not. You ever seen this man before? Let me see. Can you stand over there in the light? My eyes aren't as good as they used to be. Okay. Move over there. How's that? That's better. Is this the man who shot your wife? No, that's not the man. We left instructions for another car to take Theodore Benham to the Lincoln Sanitarium in Eagle Rock. We took Kane to Ward 1300 General Hospital. 2.42 a.m. We arrived back at the Bartlett Hotel where police chemist Ray Pinker had finished his examination. Three slugs, 38 caliber, and five slugs, 3220, were found in the mattress and the walls, all on the same side of the room. On the floor of the room were found a piece of white cloth and some brown threads. Ray Pinker returned to the crime lab while Ben and I made a search of both hotels, the incinerators, the alley, and all likely places for the missing 38 was not found. 3.48 a.m., Ben went to the record bureau to check on any possible criminal record Kane might have had. I went to the crime lab to see what Ray Pinker had found. Yeah, nothing on this one. It's been a clean mess. And yeah, nothing on these four thirty-two twenties. Mm-hmm. Where'd you find those? You dug the thirty-eight out of the window frame. Thirty-two twenties are in the south and east walls. How about the others here? Well, on these two thirty-eight slugs, I found minute portions of threads. They compare with the dress and coat one of the deceased. Mm-hmm. Hi. Hey, Ben. I checked King's record. He told the truth. Nothing more than a vague charge, huh? Mm. Yeah. How's this come? There's threads on two of the 38 slugs. And on one of the 3220s. Same kind of threads? Yeah, same kind. 3220, that's the gun Benham used. Yeah. Did you check the cloth yet? Uh, well, right now. 
Venom must have been shooting off a while. Where'd you find that thirty-two twenty slug, Ray? On the floor near the bed. Nothing on any of the other thirty-two twenties. No. Yeah, this piece of cloth matches the shirt. How about the coat and those threads? Mm, got only a couple of threads that might match. Let me have the coat. Yeah. You better have Benham take another look at Kane, huh? Yeah, I guess so. I could use a cup of coffee. How about you? As soon as we get finished. How about it, Ray? Mm, you better make it. Mm. Yeah, a match. Well, that's it, huh? Oh, one more thing. Yeah. Fresh stains on the carpet of that room. What kind? Whiskey. March 18th, we picked up Benham at Lincoln Sanitarium and drove him to the general hospital. Three times he asked us to stop someplace so he could have a drink. We told him he'd have to wait. We arrived at Ward 1300 at 1.40 p.m. and Kane was brought out. Take a good look, Mr. Benham. No, that isn't the man. I'm sure of it. All right, Kane, tie this handkerchief over your face. No, no, this way. That's right. I'll put on this cap. Okay, now stand over there, please. No, a little further. That's good. All right, Mr. Benham. You know, his eyes and forehead look a little familiar, but I don't know. Oh, my nerves are all shot. I can't be positive. I'm a sick man. All right, Kane. Wish I could help you, boys. So do we. Come along, please. Yeah, you don't have to take me back to the sanitarium. Just take me to a streetcar. I'll make it all right. Good day, Kim. Hello, Jim. Yeah. Can I see you a minute? Sure. Yeah. Did you notice anything when you first brought Kane out of the ward? No. You must have been closing the door. Yeah, I was. And that man, Benham, he winked at him. listening to Dragnet, the case history of a police investigation. We took Benham back to his sanitarium. On the way, he asked if he could be excused from testifying at the inquest and preliminary hearing. We told him it couldn't be done. 7 p.m., Ben and I returned to the general hospital and took Kane into a small room adjoining the prison ward. After three hours of interrogation, he stuck to his story. Cigarette, Kane? Thanks. How's the arm? All right. Hurts a little now. When are you guys going home? When we get a straight story. I've been telling you all I know. Yeah, you've been telling us the same story for two days, but it doesn't hold water. What do you mean? How do you account for the fact that parts of your clothing were found in that room? I told you before, you must have made a mistake. No, no, it's no mistake. And Mr. Benham's starting to think he recognizes you. What? Why do you wink at you? He didn't wink at me. We got somebody here who saw him. And he seems to think whoever did the shooting didn't take the gun with him. When we drove him back to the sanitarium, he asked us if we found it yet. He thinks we will. How long has Benham lived in L.A.? A long time. How long? Why do you want to know how long he's lived here? Is a dead woman really his wife? Well, certainly she's his wife. Why? Where's he been since the shooting? In the sanitarium in Eagle Rock. What's the matter with him? Hemophilia. You know what that is? No. You sure that was his wife? Positive. She wasn't a stool pigeon? Stool pigeon? Where'd you get that idea? You guys never saw her before? Never. You never heard of her? Kane, what's eating you? Did you check on her? We always do. You don't make mistakes on anything like that, do you? No, no. Look, she was a pretty nice woman from all we could find out. Happily married for 30 years. Something's wrong. What, Kane? What's wrong? Hold that up. Yeah? Yeah. What'd Benham say about me? We told you. He says you look a little bit like the man. Did you say anything else? He winked at you, Kane. Why? She wasn't a bad-looking woman. Wasn't she, Kane? All right, now how about it? You guys swear that was his wife? Yeah. Okay, I'll tell you where the 38 is. Where? The mattress on the roof of the Nevada Hotel. Benham cut a hole in it that day. He told me to hide the gun there after the shooting. All right, let's have a look. I don't want anybody to know I'm telling you this. Why? Benham's a real smart guy. He's got a gang. He's in on it as much as I am. Yeah? He double-crossed me. He tried to kill me. I'm going to jail. He's going with me. Maybe he will. 
Kane told us that he had known Benham for about two months. During that time, Benham helped him along by giving him a couple of dollars every once in a while. On March 11th, Benham got Kane a room in the Nevada hotel and gave him $20 to buy a gun, which Kane did. On March 15th, he gave Kane a blue bandana and a checkered cap. On March 16th, he told Kane that he'd been sent by a gang in Chicago to kill a woman who was a stool pigeon. He promised Kane $100 for his help. Early that evening, Benham told Kane how to enter their room and where to hide. When they came home, Benham stood by the door. Kane stepped out of the closet and, after a few words, shot the woman. As he moved toward the bed, Benham started shooting at him. Kane ran from the room and hid the gun in the mattress on the roof, then went to his room and flushed the cap and bandana down the drain. 11.15 p.m., Ben and I found the gun where Kane said it would be. 38 Special Detective, Colt Revolver, 2-inch barrel, number 381327. 11.52 p.m., we checked and found no evidence that Benham belonged to any kind of a gang. March 19th, 9 a.m., Ben and I reported into homicide and picked up Captain Steed. We went over to Dr. Wagner to learn his autopsy report. It showed that the deceased had been shot three times. Two thirty-eight slugs and one thirty-two twenty were recovered from the victim's body. They were initialed for evidence. 8 p.m., Captain Steed, Ben and I went to the sanitarium and told Benham that there were a few angles we wanted to clear up before the inquest next morning. Benham got dressed and we drove back to the Bartlett Hotel. It was raining. I'm still trying to remember what happened. I was very shocked that night. Yeah, I suppose you were. Well, sometimes my memory comes back for a little bit. The red light? Yeah, I see. You know, the man who did the shooting knew you lived in room 432. And he knew you'd be gone that night. How do you suppose he figured that out? Well, I've been noticing that a lot of men have been following me. Suspicious looking men. I told that to Sergeant Friday, didn't I, Sergeant? Yeah, that's right. Must have been one of them. You ever give money to characters on the street so much they might follow you? Hey, that must be it. Many times I used to do that. I'd be nice to them. They'd try to make friends. You remember any of them? Yeah, yeah, I do. There was a uh, old man Dorsey and Jolly Swanson and a fellow named uh, Kane. Blaine. Kane? Yeah, that, that's it, Kane. There you are. There you are. Uh, the young man you took me to see in the hospital. I, I, I'm thinking, I believe that's Kane. Are you sure? Quite sure. He's the burglar. What makes you think he was a burglar? Well, what else would he be? He didn't rifle any of the drawers or steal anything, did he? he must have got there just before us. Did you have anything important there? Uh, yes, some insurance policies. And your wife? Yeah. How much? Well, one policy for 4000 and two for 2500 each. Who's the beneficiary? Well, uh, I am. We took Benham up to room 432, where he got out the insurance policies on his wife and showed them to us. Then Captain Steed asked him to reenact the shooting. Benham acted as the killer. I played Benham, and Ben acted as his wife. Well, uh, the man was over here in the closet. My wife and I came in that door, and then my wife went over to the dresser. Oh, over here? Did you turn on the light? Oh, yeah, and then I closed the door and went over behind her. Like this? Oh, uh, she was closer to the bed. Uh, here? Yeah. Were you standing next to her? Yeah. Did you start to take off your coat? Well, I was just going to when this man stepped out of this closet here. How far? Oh, here. Yeah, yeah, right here. And then what? Well, he held the gun in his hand and asked how much money we had. Elizabeth said we didn't have much. From here? Yeah, but but, but she turned around. Like this? Yeah, that's it. What happened then? Well, then I said I haven't got very much, but I'll give you what we have. And he started shooting. Yeah, but you said before that your wife started looking in her purse. Uh, yeah, that's it. She did. I forgot. And that made him think she was going after a gun. How do you know? Well, I, I suppose that's what he thought. He shot and Elizabeth fell on the bed. I pulled out my gun and started shooting and the man ran out the door and that's all. That's exactly what happened, huh? Just as I remember it. Will I help you? Not very much. What's the matter? Well, if you were standing where I am, there'd be bullet holes on uh, that side of the room there, wouldn't it? They're all on this side. I see. I, I got it. Uh, come with me. Where are you going? Uh, on the roof. What for? I want to show you something. Uh, it's raining. There are two umbrellas in the closet. I'll get them. Why do you want to go up there? I, I think I know where that gun might be hidden. I'll bet it's there. Here, you take this umbrella. Thanks. We'll take this one, Captain. Let's go. I 
bet it's up there. We'll find it. You got your flashlight, Ben? Yeah. Should be around here somewhere. What? The mattress. My wife used to take sun baths on it. Where would it be? Oh, just about here. I don't see any. You sure it's up here? I bet it's on the next roof. Didn't you say Kane lived in that hotel? He probably moved it. Hey. Flash your light over there behind that elevator shaft. There? Yeah, there. You see it? We have to climb over this parapet to get on the other roof. Watch it, Jab. It's pretty slippery. Okay. Man, it is slippery. This mattress here? That's it. Take a look, Joe. Right. No, nothing here. Did you look all around there? Did you look in the corners? No. Well, that'd be a good place to hide a gun, don't you think? Here, let me see. Might be a hole cut in one of them. No, maybe the other corner. No. Well, maybe this one. Yeah, you see, the mattress has been cut. No. No, it's, it's got to be here. Where is it? It's, it's here, I tell you. It's here. I know it's here. I'll find it. I'll find it. You wait. You'll see. I'll get it. I know it's here. I'll find it. You wait, I'll get it. I'll get it. I'll get it. Getting wet, Joe. We got the 38 Kane told us about it. You ready to talk? Yeah. Insurance. That why you did it? Yeah. I'm a sick man. Let's go, Benham. On your feet. All right. They played that ball game the other day. Yeah? Who won? Pirates, eight to seven. Sure do like baseball. Must be a real nice business. Yeah. Fans only yell if they never do it. What's that? Kill the umpire. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On July 2nd, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 89, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Thomas Kane was convicted of second-degree murder and received a term as prescribed by law. Theodore V. Benham was convicted of first-degree murder and assault with a deadly weapon. He received a life sentence and died in prison one year later. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Andrew Ryan's with otrwesterns.com, where we stream live old-time radio westerns 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, with a special twist. You select the tracks that get to be played. We've got a thousand different episodes from shows like Gunsmoke, Tales of the Texas Rangers, Escape, Gene Autry, and many more. Come check us out at otrwesterns.com slash live. Again, that's otrwesterns.com slash live. You're listening to The Great Detectives of Old Time Radio with Adam Graham. And now, let's get back into the show. Welcome back. Well, this was an interesting take on the idea of the perfect murder. If you were reading a book or watching um, a movie, you'd see the perfect murder committed by a suave, rich, wealthy man to get even more wealthy off the death of his wife. Here we see a guy planning and botching a $9,000 uh, plan 
and proves in the process that he's not quite as smart. And many programs would say things like, you can't outsmart the FBI. You just can't defeat the police. Here, though, they opt to instead just show somebody try. And they get the message across just as effectively, if not more so. Now, one oddity about this episode for listeners who were born in the last 60 years ago is this idea of going to see the Pirates and the Cubs play in an exhibition game in Los Angeles. The important thing to remember uh, was that at this point, uh, the uh, L.A. did not have its own major league team. In fact, in 1950, if you wanted to see Major League Baseball and you were west of St. Louis, you were pretty much out of luck. Major League Baseball wouldn't come to Los Angeles until 1958. Los Angeles played host to at least one and occasionally two minor league teams. There was the Los Angeles Angels and another minor league team that played there uh, was the Hollywood Stars. The Angels played at Wrigley Field. And yes, there was a Wrigley Field in Los Angeles. And it had more parking available than the Wrigley Field in Chicago. In fact, it still uh, it has more uh, parking than the current uh, Wrigley Field uh, situation. And it was not only the home for minor league baseball, it was where Hollywood went to film baseball movies. They filmed The Pride of the Yankees there, along with the original Angels in the Outfield movie from 1952. And, of course, the Home Run Derby series from the early 60s. There was also an episode of The Twilight Zone that was uh, filmed there, as well as an episode of The Munsters. I know I'm getting a little off topic, but it came up in my research, and Wrigley Field in Los Angeles is on the list now of places I would love to go and visit if I got a time machine. But yeah, uh, teams could definitely come through and play exhibition games on the West Coast, just as they play exhibition games in uh, Florida and Arizona as part of spring training. But Major League Baseball was still about eight years away from coming West. And then uh, we do have a comment here from Haya, who says... Hi, uh, it's Haya Simkin. My boyfriend and I both love Dragnet and your Dragnet shows. I have a couple questions about the mission scene. What is the song played when everyone goes marching off to lunch? Uh, this ne um, The answer is that it was Onward Christian Soldiers. And it was a song where the words were written by the Anglican priest, uh, Sabine Baring Gold. Uh, in 1865, and the music was written by Arthur Sullivan of Gilbert and Sullivan in 1871. Um, it's commonly associated with the Salvation Army as their processional hymn, and having it played there at the end of a service does kind of evoke the Salvation Army. But in a more practical sense, uh, the song had the virtue under the then uh, copyright laws, in effect, uh, a song uh, would only be in copyright uh, for uh, a total of 56 years. So that one came into the public domain in 1927. So the music could be used without paying any sort of royalty. The second question is, um, this next one may be a dumb question, since I don't know much about Christianity. Why does the preacher call everyone brother and sister? I know Catholics call monks and nuns that, but whether the mission is Catholic or not, this can't be the case, since Friday and Romero aren't monks at all. Uh, thank you for your show. It's a great way to start the week. Well, I, uh, it's been quite a while since they mentioned their outfits. Uh, <laughs> no, I, seriously, I, that is a good question. Um... There are various different approaches to how people are uh, addressed in various uh, Christian denominations. Some will use a phrase, um, brother and sister, to relate to uh, all uh, Christians, or they'll use it to relate to all uh, people as uh, uh, brothers and sisters. 
There is an important thing to say about Dragnet in the 1950s, and when it comes to the way that it writes and portrays uh, Protestant missions and ministers, and certainly there was definitely no sort of ill will intended, but there really wasn't uh, any apparent uh, research. And so the way that they're written is just very cor kind of uh, cheesy and, uh, and in a way that's uh, really clunky. It wasn't actually all that bad last week, but it is something that you will hear throughout the series where, for whatever reason... Uh, it was just not as well researched. And it may have been because there were assumptions about the audience at the time that you were dealing with a nation where perhaps majority Protestant, and so they would actually know how an actual Protestant minister would sound, so it wasn't really thought of as a big deal. And of course, it wasn't just uh, Dragnet. You'll find in a lot of shows and movies that there are kind of uh, very basic stereotypical pictures uh, that are painted. Uh, and I think that did become a bit of an issue for the Salvation Army. And in 1958, they launched their own uh, radio series, uh, Heartbeat Theater. The series highlighted the Salvation Army's role as a provider of community relief and social services and their efforts to help people uh, throughout the community to highlight the sort of work they did. And it was a very good series that actually continued to run into the 1980s. But in short, with Dragnet, you'll get a lot of great looks at how things were uh, in the 1950s in so many areas. But I would say that uh, that one area where you probably don't really get a feel for how people are like or were like is when the show goes into portraying rescue missions and uh, Protestant ministries. They just tend to go for the more hokey. And that, like I said, last week wasn't the biggest example of that, but there are others. So consider yourself advised. All right, another uh, listener comment. Uh, Michelle comments... Uh, I love the details you give us in the commentary before and at the end of each show. Thank you for all your research and enthusiasm. Uh, and then uh, Douglas says, uh, your followers may be interested to know they can download almost every uh, radio show ever produced for free at uh, archive.org. Uh, well, th thanks, Douglas. And uh, you can certainly download though most of those who are uh, that are available at uh, archive.org. Though a few of the more obscure series uh, you'll have to search elsewhere for. All right, well, that will do it for today. We will be back tomorrow with our 1600th episode special. It's Edmund O'Brien. You won't want to miss it. And then join us on Monday for The Saint. Next Saturday, we'll be back with another episode of Dragnet. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter 